Father, we thank you that we can come together this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for your presence. Yeah. Lord, you are very welcome in this place. We make you welcome. We honor your name and bless your name as the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Yeah. We thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. We ask for your anointing upon the word that it go forth and achieve that for which it is sent. Lord, that it does not return void and that our lives will never be the same. Yeah. Not for the sake of the preacher, but for the sake of your word. Yeah. We give you all the honor and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. After I had about three hours and precisely nothing at the end of it, I thought, mm. I'll go for a drive and uh, clean my head, come back and approach it again. While, while I was driving, there was a, a song I've Listen to it. up in the place of Toowoomba. Uh, I tend to, I've got the YouTube tuned into uh, uh, the TV, so I just automatically go to it and put some Hill Song stuff on, or praise and worship and whatever on, which is just going in the background of during the day. There's a song there that um, I've listened to quite a bit, I have no idea what it's called, um, but while I, after three hours when I had precisely nothing, um, then as I was away in the car, this song, or at least a few words of the song kept coming back to me over and over and over. And the song, the words were, uh, I am chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am. I don't know the song overall or what it's called, but those words, I'm chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am, just coming over and over and over. So I kind of went home and started with that and that's where we'll go from. We have an identity in Christ and out of that identity we have a position and from that position we have authority and from that authority uh, we have a mandate. So it starts with you are chosen. Um, if you've if you got a Bible here this afternoon, if you want to have access to one on the phone or whatever you've got, you open up to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. I want to start this in the Old Testament and just go to a parallel in the New Testament. But Deuteronomy 7, 6, it says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. It's talking about Israel, of course. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. You chosen, you have an identity in the New Testament. It says you're a chosen generation, so there's a direct parallel. There's a, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, um, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Probably fair to say some of us are a little more peculiar than the others, but, but um, basically you know, we see in scripture first the natural and the spiritual. So what what happened through the Old Testament naturally has a direct spiritual parallel in the New Testament. But having said that you are chosen and you have an identity, there are a lot of voices, a lot of voices that will question the validity of your identity and also what you're doing. Some of the voices are spiritual, some natural, sometimes it's your own voice based upon past failures, past negative experiences uh, and, and the limitations that you start to impose upon yourself just out of those experiences. Many times it's a demonic voice wanting to limit, hinder, uh, and impose boundaries that are not necessarily relevant or valid. And of course, sometimes it can be fam family. We know when David went and uh, confronted Goliath, uh, his brothers uh, had plenty to say that were, that was quite derogatory as well. So a lot of voices, be they natural or spiritual or internal voices of your own, will often question your identity. 
Even when, when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, the devil said to him, well, if you're the Son of God, and he did that twice, if you're the Son of God, do nothing so. I've heard it preached, and I don't necessarily agree with it, that the devil himself at that point was not sure, and he was trying to find out himself. I don't necessarily agree with that, because in the previous chapter uh, at the Jordan River, uh, John the Baptist has said, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And the Father has said, uh, You know, the Holy Spirit has come upon Jesus. And the Father has said, My beloved, beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. So there would have been demonic presence uh, witnessing that. I don't think there's any doubt that the devil knew who he was. But it's also sometimes not a question of just um, questioning your identity or trying to uh, you know, disenfranchise you from your true identity. But sometimes what it is, is trying to attack your motivation. You know, why are you doing this? Who you, which voice are you going to respond to and for what reason? Jesus basically is told that they were to shut up his written. So apart from anything else, he's not going to respond and prove who he is or what he is to some stinking devil. So it's sometimes not just a question of wanting to attack your identity, but let's test your motivation. Which voice are you going to respond to and why? And sometimes it's the timing. Well, you might respond to the right voice, but is this the right time? Or are you responding to the wrong voice and why? So there's a lot of aspects of your identity that will, particularly if you feel that you have a call of God on your life, a lot of aspects of your identity that will be uh, given a test drive. In Deuteronomy, uh, they're a chosen generation. We know the story that uh, they were under slavery to Pharaoh. They were taken out under the uh, blood of the Passover lamb. And they were taken from there through the wilderness into the promised land. They were supposed to do a couple of things in that land. They were supposed to dispossess the existing occupants. They were supposed to possess the land for themselves. They were supposed to occupy it. And they were supposed to not compromise with the gods of the people that were there. Dispossess, possess, occupy, and don't compromise. We have the same thing spiritually in the New Testament. Really. We are, as an ecclesia, supposed to release heaven on earth. We are supposed to dispossess, possess, occupy, and not compromise. Spiritually, as they did naturally. My question, without criticism, would be how we've done so far. Pro probably up until a little bit of debate here and there, but that's not entirely the point of this afternoon. So they were supposed to go from slavery to this land and live under a theocracy. So in other words, they had a move completely changed jurisdictional authority. So they had to move from a jurisdictional authority of slavery and possession through a process to come under a jurisdictional authority of God. Same thing for us. Colossians 1.13 We've delivered you from the authority of the powers of darkness and transferred, translated you into the kingdom of his beloved son. We do the same thing spiritually that they did naturally. And as we come under that theocracy, we are to dispossess, possess, occupy, 
and not compromise. A little bit difficult, they, they of course in Israel, um, we know the history, uh, they decided they wanted a king like other nations. Historically they compromised, they, they did all sorts of crazy things with false gods, idol worship that led to judgment and redemption and judgment and redemption and the whole cycle that, that we're aware of. It's very hard, <coughs> very hard, not only possible, to dispossess something that you're still holding hands with. Like somebody said somewhere, you know, it's very hard to be the bride of Christ if you're still Satan's girlfriend. Um, <laughs> We, we sometimes unwittingly compromise with stuff that we shouldn't and then we want to get rid of it, but you know, it's hard to dispossess with something we're still holding hands with. Under this covenant in Deuteronomy, they were under a covenant of law. So everything, their, their blessing, their provision, Everything was dependent upon their own performance. And probably one of the best examples of that, at least scripturally, is Deuteronomy 28.1. You know, if you listen to everything that I tell you to do, and do everything that I tell you to do, then these blessings will come upon you. Or alternatively, if you don't, the, the following curses will come upon you. All I can say for me personally is thank God I'm living under grace. If I was living under Deuteronomy 28 1, I think I'd be in a fair bit of trouble. Uh, in fact, I could pretty much guarantee it. So everything depended upon their own performance. There is, when you read what happened in the process from uh, Egypt through the wilderness and past Sinai and ultimately into the generation that came into Canaan. An interesting comparison of what happened in law and grace. Now we know when they were in Egypt and they're still under Pharaoh's bondage, at that time they're still under the Abrahamic covenant. Because the blood of the lamb had to be manifested under a covenant of faith and grace. It could not be used or manifested under a covenant of law. So the Abrahamic covenant is a covenant of faith and grace. They're still under a covenant of faith and grace at that point, blood of the Passover lamb, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea and so on. You know, at a place called Mara, they're murmuring and saying all sorts of negative stuff because of the bitter water. Now what did God do? Just made the water speak. The next chapter, they're murmuring about the food, where they are hungry. So God gives them manna in the morning, and quails in the evening. So their negativity and their mannering, uh, their murmuring, their mannering, their mannering and their murmuring, uh, it, all, all that's happening from that is grace. They're murmuring, they're complaining, they're whining and whinging, they're criticizing. But the response is the love of God. Then in Exodus 31, they get to Sinai. The covenant changes at Sinai and becomes a covenant of law. It's now de not dependent upon the grace and the goodness of God. It's dependent upon their performance. So then we jump to Numbers 14, and they're murmuring, of, you know, they've gone in and with God just said, look, go and have a look at what I'm giving you, but if you didn't ask for a uh, logistical sort of report or anything else, or a military assessment or anything else, he said, go and have a look at what I'm giving you. They came back and said, you know, look, look at the giants, look at whatever. And they begin to murmur and complain and so on. What happened there? Now, in between, Mara and the, the issue over the food, we've got Sinai. We're now after Sinai. What did the murmuring get them after Sinai and the law? 
your carcass is going to fall in the wilderness. Grace, law. Grace, they're just dependent upon the grace and the love of God, your problems, issues, whining, moaning, whatever, all they're getting is grace. Switch to law, now you're responsible for your own performance, your carcass is falling in the wilderness. What we've got to bear in mind, I'm sort of jumping ahead of this a bit anyway, that's okay. What we've got to bear in mind is that we are under grace, but it says the law is the strength of sin. So as long as we remain under grace, are aware we are under grace, and lean on grace, then we're okay. We literally remove the strength of sin. But the moment we go back under personal performance and put ourselves under law and performance and so on, we now re-empower sin. We restore the strength to sin. Because Romans says, sin will not have dominion over you because you're not under law, you're under grace. So the strength of sin is removed by grace, or the strength of sin is restored by law. So as long as you work under grace, lean upon grace, you remove the strength of sin. Go back under performance, put yourself back under law, and try and deal with it in your own strength, whatever you're dealing with in life. If you're dealing with it according to your own strength and your own performance, then you're giving the strength back to the sin. Does that kind of make a bit of sense? So if you turn over to um, turn over to Hebrews chapter eight. I did one yesterday morning. I started off with three hours of nothing. Then I went up with some notes, which I'm taking no notice of anyway. So we're doing well. So Hebrews chapter eight, verse six and seven. Hebrews eight, verse six and seven. But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better covenant, better promises. For if the first covenant had uh, had been faultless, then there would be no place sought for a second. So we now thank God under a covenant of grace. There's a direct parallel between what they were supposed to do under law, take possession of land, occupy, dispossess, no, no compromise and so on, and the church, the ecclesia, are supposed to be doing the same in the land today. I'm not entirely sure how successful we are, probably moderately so. Now, at the beginning of the covenant, when, when Jesus comes on the scene, John the Baptist in chapter 3 of Matthew says these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the very next chapter, in chapter 4 of Matthew, Jesus says exactly the same words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I want you to bear in mind, Israel was under the Abrahamic covenant in, in Egypt that changed at Sinai. So you have a, an Abrahamic covenant, which is a covenant of faith and grace. At Sinai, it changed to law and remained basically in law until the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came as actually the seal of the new covenant. So you've gone faith and grace, law, faith and grace. So you've got a covenant of law sandwiched between two covenants of faith and grace. So bear that in mind. So the first words of Jesus preaching, introduced also by John the Baptist, is repent 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, if you're going to take hold of this kingdom, and, and the word kingdom in the New Testament is always the same. It's a word called basileria. I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but it's pretty close to it. Basileria. And it's never talking about a location. It is always talking about dominion and authority of the king. So you, you need to repent. That is, change the way you're thinking, change the way you're behaving, change, change. you've got to basically change or turn around because if you don't, you're going to miss what is about to be released. Now in Hebrew, the word repent, and, and we know in generally speaking in English the word repent uh, means to turn around or go in a different direction. In Hebrew, the word repent is the word teshuva, T-E-S-H-U-V-A-H, teshuva. It has five letters in, in the word in the, uh, the Hebrew alphabet. Tav, Shin, Vav, Bet, Hay. Again, on my pronunciation. In the, in the picture or the pictogram of the first letter, Tav, is the cross. The fifth letter, Hay, Five in Hebrew is the number of grace. So the word repent begins with a cross and ends with grace. In between those two letters, Tav and Hay, what you actually have is three other letters, Shin, Vav, Bet. In Hebrew, it's the word Shuv. And shuv means return. So repent literally means cross, return, grace. Yeah. In other words, putting it, I suppose, a little bit better grammar, because of the cross, yeah. return to grace. Mm -hmm. Literally what repent means. So what we have is grace, law, grace. Because of the cross, turn away from the law, we're going back to grace. Literally, literally what repent means in that context. Grace, in, in my own opinion, experience, whatever it may be worth, grace on one hand is uh, wonderful, um, easy to understand, not always easy to walk in. in. In this context, grace basically means, look, I'm leaning entirely not on my performance, but I'm leaning entirely on what Jesus has done. It's not about what I need to do, it's about what Jesus has already done. The problem with grace for most of us, certainly me anyway, there's at least in my generation, I mean, things change over generations. But when I was a kid, if you misbehaved, you got a slap on the behind. If you went to school and misbehaved, in my generation, you got the cane. Yep. Sent to the headmaster's office, whatever. So in other words, performance-based, behave well, do well, maybe get a lolly, whatever, you know, rewarded. Behave well at school, um, you'll be okay. But misbehave, you get a slap or get the cane. At the end of school, particularly in, in senior in those days, which was year 12, we had a major exam which determined the number of points you got, which you either got a university scholarship, whatever the case might be, and pretty much whatever happened, which was entirely performance-based in that final year 12 exam, that literally pretty much dictated the course of the rest of your life, at least academically. 
So again, it's entirely personally performance based. You then went to work and if you did well, you may well be promoted or rewarded, bonus, whatever the case may be. On the other hand, if you didn't do well, you may well find yourself looking for another job. So in other words, from this high to adult employment, everything was based upon my performance. You know, do well, get rewarded, don't do well, and you're in a fair bit of trouble. So everything in life, everything in life was geared to my, yours, whatever, personal performance and the results and the consequence of your personal performance. That's life. Then along comes somebody and wants to introduce you to grace. And you know, say what now? It no longer depends on my performance, it's about somebody else's performance. And on the one hand, it's easy to understand. You can read it, it makes sense. You know, praise God, hallelujah, or whatever. But as easy as it is, it's kind of hard sometimes to wrap your head around and walk through. Particularly if you're a slightly older generation. I use the word slightly older for myself. Uh, is for those of you who are wondering, I'm actually only 38, but I've had a very hard life. Um, <laughs> nearly 39. But, um, you know, I've grown up with performance. And somebody's telling me it's all about grace. Real easy to understand, not so easy sometimes to really walk in. If you haven't read it, there's a great book, a couple of great books actually by a guy called uh, Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince runs a fantastic church in Singapore. I had the pleasure of meeting him in 96, which was just before he started really preaching grace. Great guy, went to his church a few times. There's a uh, book called Destined to Reign, uh, really worth reading if you haven't read it. There's another one called, uh, I think it's got a read camera, it's called Unmerited Favour. And there's another one called Grace Revolution. Um, any of those, uh, I would thoroughly recommend. Great reading. So grace, grace is marvellous, wonderful, easy to understand. Sometimes not, not the easiest thing to walk through. But keep your focus on Jesus. You know, sometimes people mistakenly think I'm kind of jumping all over the place with these notes. I'm kind of looking at the notes and getting more confused myself. All over the place. Sometimes people, and we, again in the generation, I've been saved for nearly 40 years. When I was first saved and for a while after, I was usually told, heard preached a lot, you know, the Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of your sin. Like, you, you, you know, if you do something wrong, I mean, the Holy Spirit will be quick to convict you of your sin. I mean, that, that's what his job is. It's not. Completely untrue. The Holy Spirit's job is not to convict you of your sin. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict you of your righteousness. Truly. Let me... Uh, Turn over to uh, John 16. I'm all over the place with these notes, but that's okay. So John 16, <clears throat> verse 7 to 11. And Jesus here is talking about the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Verse, sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse um, 7 to 11. So nevertheless, this is Jesus speaking. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I don't go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. And if I depart, I'll send him to you. When he's come, he'll reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. 
of sin because they don't believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. The unsaved world gets convicted of sin. The devil gets convicted of judgment. You get convicted of righteousness. Any time you are feeling convicted and condemned of something you did wrong, I'm only talking about myself, I know you guys don't do that anymore, so I'm just, but any time you ever get convicted of doing something wrong and are feeling condemned, understand something very clearly. That's not the Holy Spirit. There is therefore no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus. And in the scripture, in Romans 4, 8, it says, Blessed is the man for whom he will not impute sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their sin. When you're in Christ, your sin, can we sin? Yep. I'm talking about myself again, of course. Um, can we sin? Yep, definitely. But is it imputed or counted against you? No. Because there is no law of double indemnity. It was dealt with on the cross once and for all. Yeah. There is no law of double indemnity where he will put it upon Jesus and then remind you of the oh, law. Remember last week? Oh, seriously? Not a hope. Now, the reason the Holy Spirit does not convict you of your sin is because how can he convict you of something that was never counted against you in the first place? Yeah. So if you're feeling convicted and condemned, that, my friends, is a demonic spirit. Because the Holy Spirit will remind you of your righteousness in Christ. He will reprove the world of sin and the devil of judgment coming, but those in Christ, he will remind them of their righteousness. Yeah. Lean upon grace. Because he who is, had no sin was made sin that you would be made the righteousness of God. Amen. You cannot be the righteousness of God in the morning, then have some sort of, you know, Somebody cuts you off a track or whatever, and uh, you, you give them a little bit of hand language or a bit of verbal language that perhaps you shouldn't, uh, not entirely sanctified. And go, oh, man, that's the righteousness of God this morning, but this afternoon's looking a bit ordinary. Well, you might have done or said something dumb, and maybe even sin, but it's not counted against you. You, 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 you know, there's no sort of schizophrenia that somehow, like on an hour by hour basis or a minute by minute basis, like I'm righteousness and then I repent and then, yeah. then I blow it again and right. then I'm righteous for half an hour and then I don't know. You know. It doesn't work that way. You are the righteousness of God, period, yes. because sin has been dealt with once and for all. Yes. Your sin is not, not imputed to you period, because there is no law of double indemnity, and the Holy Spirit is here when you do mess up to remind you of your righteousness, to remind you of your righteousness, remind you of your righteousness, yeah. to keep going, keep working in the grace and the righteousness of God. Yeah. That made a bit of sense. Yeah. Okay. The cross changed everything. In Leviticus chapter 16, about verse 14 and 15, just to say a bit of time, we might fill in here, but if you want to have a look at it later. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 14 and 15, it's speaking about the blood of the sin offering. The blood of the bullock 
is sprinkled before the mercy seat seven times. When the blood of the goat, which is a sin offering for the people, the same thing is done with the blood of the goat as the bullock. So it's sprinkled before the mercy seat seven times. So when we get to Jesus, because there is a progressive shedding of blood through the whole Old Testament into the New Testament. In Genesis, uh, God provided skins for coverings for Adam and Eve. So the skins came from the death of an animal that hadn't sinned. So there was a, a precedent set there that the covering for sin was going to come from God himself and it would involve the shedding of innocent blood. So innocent blood is shed for an individual. We then get into, in, into Exodus, and the blood of the Passover lamb, blood is now shed for a household. We get into Leviticus, where we are here now, and the blood of the sin offering is for the people. So blood for an individual, blood for a household, blood for a nation, all pointing to Jesus, where it says that he was a propitiation not only for our sin, but for the sin of the whole world. So blood from Genesis right through, individual, household, nation, all of humanity. And we see in Leviticus that the blood of the sin offering was sprinkled seven times. So the blood of Jesus to fulfill the prophetic type had to be sprinkled seven times. So he sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, first time. He was taken to the high priest's house and beaten, when you read the original language, he's probably beaten with sticks and clubs. I mean, it took a fairly savage beating there. His blood is sprinkled again. Went to the Roman Praetorium, crowned with thorns, blood sprinkled for the third time. Scourged with a whip, blood for the fourth time. Nails through the hands, blood for the fifth time. Nails through the feet, blood for the sixth time. Spear through the side, outflow, blood and water seven times. So the blood of Jesus was sprinkled seven times to fulfill the type of the sin offering. Every time it was sprinkled, it paid for something for you. First John, second John, sorry, second John chapter one, verse three and four says, by his divine power, by his divine power, he has given you all things, not some things, all things that pertain to life, that is your physical life here on earth, and godliness, which is your spiritual life. So by his divine power he has given you, now Deuteronomy 28 no longer exists, because Deuteronomy 28 under law said, if you keep these conditions, these are the blessings. But 2 Peter 1 says that by his divine power he's given. Romans 8.32 says, if he has not withheld his only son, will he not freely with him give you all things? So grace has removed the conditions. And now everything is given by grace. So the blood was sprinkled seven times. Through his blood, you are redeemed. You are brought back out of the hand of the enemy. Through his blood, you are cleansed. Through his blood, you are justified, just as if you'd never sinned. You are the righteousness of God. So you are redeemed, you are cleansed, you are justified, and you are sanctified. Through his blood, you have access to the holiest place in the universe, the throne of God. Through his blood, you have the eternal life of God flowing through your veins. And the blood of Jesus intercedes for you in heaven, speaking of better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel was sprinkled on earth and cried out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus was sprinkled in the Holy of Holies and cried out for mercy. That's what it means by his blood speaking of better things than the blood of Abel. His blood, so it's spiritual. Naturally, all things pertaining to life and godliness, the blood that was sweated literally, 
in the Garden of Eden. I don't know if you've ever thought of what, I mean, this is the stuff that maybe I'm kind of wired a bit differently, I don't know. Like, why in the garden? What was the big deal about the garden? Was there something that it needed to happen in the garden? Yeah, why? Here it is. Way back before, in another garden called Eden, Adam, in his rebellion, said, not your I will. Now in another garden, the second Adam said, I will. Reverse the curse. And literally brought back your free will out of the hand of the enemy and re redeemed your ability to say no about that. They took him to the high priest's house, beat him, the blood was sprinkled there, it says the chastisement of our peace was upon him. It was the my peace I give you. Not as the world gives it, but my peace I give you. It was his blood patron. Took him to the Roman Praetorium, crowned him with thorns. Why thorns? It made a crown out of anything. Why thorns? Well, back in the garden of Eden, thorns and thistles were the symbol of hard work, sweat, and poverty. He was crowned literally with the symbol of hard work, sweat, and poverty that he took out poverty that we would have these riches. Blood that came from that crown of thorns literally paid for your prosperity. The blood that came from his back being ripped open like a ploughed field paid for your health. The blood that came from the nails through his hands redeemed your authority over everything that you lay hands on or everything that you touch. The blood that came from the nails through his feet redeemed your authority everywhere you walk as a priest and a king on the earth. And the blood from the spear through his side, he was rejected that you might be accepted. And now you are accepted and beloved. The cross changed everything. Righteousness no longer depends upon your performance. It's all about what Jesus has already done. He whom you know sin became sin that you might become the righteousness of God. Your position is no longer dependent upon your performance. Your position is also by grace. Your position is as the son and the daughter of the living God. I want you to cry out of heart. We are the children of God. Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God, and if children, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Your position is that you are a child of God, and you are a joint heir with Jesus, which means that you have access to exactly the same resources that he does. When you are an heir and a child, and you know you belong to a wealthy household, wealthy family, uh, you have access to the family resources. And just in case there was any doubt about it, Ephesians 2.19 says, You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens and of the household of God. That's sort of like saying, well, I no longer strangers and foreigners, we're fellow citizens. It's like saying, you're not just, if, you, if you're a Brit, you're not just a citizen of the UK, you are a member of the royal family. And if a member of the royal family, then you have access to the same resources that the family has, because you're an heir and joint heir of Jesus, and you are a member of the royal family. It says we we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but He raised us up together and seated us with Jesus in heavenly places. He said He has raised us up, not He will raise us up. So it's not a future event; it's already happened. Spiritually, physically, you're sitting here. Spiritually, you're already sitting with Jesus in other places. Hebrews 12, 20, 24 says, You have come 
to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, surrounded by an innumerable company of angels. You have come. Not you will come. You have, you're already there. Spiritually, you are already seated with Jesus and everything. You, your position is by grace. Yes. It has nothing to do with your performance. You are adopted into the family of God. You're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. You're a member of the royal family. You're seated with Jesus in heavenly places in the city of the living God, surrounded by an innumerable company of angels. That's your position. You are there right now yes. because of grace. The, great, the grace of God and the cross, I mean, it's just staggering. And your, your provision, so your righteousness, your position, and now your provision, no longer performance-based. Because your provision is no longer a Deuteronomy 28 scenario in the law. Your provision is now, if he has not withheld his only son, will he not with him freely give us all things. By his divine power he has given us all things. The grace removed the conditions. When we, when we keep that in mind you'll never and, and perspective is sometimes everything. In Numbers 14 there were 12 spies went into the, the land. 11 of them came back with their perspective that, yeah, look, it's really good. Look at the size of the, you know, bunches of grapes. And wow, it's really, really, it flows with milk and honey. But nevertheless, and their perspective saw the problems. Caleb said, no. Nah, God's given it to us, let's, let's go up and take it now, today, Let, let's go. And Caleb had a different perspective. Perspective can sometimes be everything. Bearing in mind your position, your authority, your provision, your righteousness, everything that the cross has done, when you are encountering a demonic attack, when you're trying to work through something, your perspective and your position is you are working from victory, not to victory. You're already there. It really puts things in a whole different format. Because otherwise we think, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling financially, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, you know, I'm trying to work towards it. No, I'm already there, receiving what we've already been given. So we're always working from victory, not to victory. With that in mind, I, let's, let's finish on this. I, I copied this this morning out of um, Colossians 2. Verse 13 to 15, it's from the Passion Translation. Yeah. This is, I guess, our operation platform. So this is Colossians 2, 13 to 15, Passion Translation. It says, this realm of death describes our former state. For we were held in sin's grasp. But now, we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. For we are forever alive and forgiven of all our sins. He cancelled out every legal violation we had on our record and the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us. He erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all. And they cannot be retrieved. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness. 
stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. And by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. That's our operation of that platform. You are chosen, not to say her. You are. But he says you are. Praise God. All I can say is, God, I'm living under grace. Yeah. I, I don't know about anyone else, but I suspect if I was still under the law, um, yeah, I might be in a fair bit of trouble. Thank God for the blood of Jesus and thank God for his grace. 